And we are live. So I'm back. I haven't done this one in a while, but I got my good friend, Steven Sisler. We met a couple of years ago at Mastermind Talks, and we went through his uh, human behavioral assessment profile. And you kind of, you hit me with like the most accurate reading of who I am. You said, listen, Amir, you're a fucking hurricane tornado. Whatever you set your eyes to, you'll do it. You'll be like this for a very long time. Eventually you're going to slow down, maybe like your mid forties, but you're pretty much crazy. I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Who I am. <laughs> and I'm like, e -e -e, bingo. Right. And so yeah, ever, yeah. ever since I've been following uh, what you do and I appreciate the work you put in, I appreciate everything that you publish. And so basically I want to have you on this, uh, you know, one of the first many uh, video podcasts over here talking about kind of something I've been kind of experimenting with lately, but you see it today where you have radical different viewpoints in the world. For example, we can talk about the viewpoints of politics. You have people sitting on the left, you have people sitting on the right, you have the socialists in the far left, and maybe you have far you know, libertarians over here. In your studies, and I know you and I, right before the show, you were talking about your history. If you want to bring it up, sure. If you don't, it's okay. But in your studies, like, what do you think it's going to take for us to understand more of each side? Because it's almost like screaming at a wall. No one's acknowledging the information they're hearing. It's like, yeah, yeah, and, you know, it's like scream, 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 scream. Doesn't go anywhere at all, proven through history. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what happens is there's a series of circumstances or events. You know, you've heard of the inciting incident. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that can disrupt a society. Uh, a good example of that is when the Twin Towers fell, the whole nation came together. Yes. It, it, it really did come. It, it lasted like 11 weeks, <laughs> right? But the whole nation came together through an inciting incident. So it has to be something outside of themselves that affects them that causes humans to go back to a very past evolutionary process of community to survive. Mm. Um, but intellectual goggly gook is not going to work. Um, so you're talking about pretty much, I think his, uh, Stephen Younger, he has a book tribe. Okay. And uh, or if you're talking about like Nassim Talib, he talks about anti-fragile. So certain like black swan events must occur for humans to come together. OK, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's uh, I mean, this sounds horrific. And I don't even know if I want to say it because it's because it's going to get out from my mind into the world. Uh, uh, but it, it's like I think about like you do the country, the where people are at as far as tribal difference. And things of that sort. And I think what we really need is a good dirty bomb to go off. <laughs> like, like in my mind, that's going to be a big enough inciting incident to create a move to solidarity based mm. upon being human um, and not representing a tribe among humans. Um, and uh, you know, I talk about this a lot when baby Jessica McClure fell in the well in 1987 in Midland, Texas. This photo is online. And I, it's going to have one in my book um, that's coming out. But um, the whole town is like gathered in the backyard of this family's house while they're trying to get an 18 month baby out of a well uh, uh, that fell down in there. It took them 54 hours to get the baby out. Um, and uh you know nobody said oh you know the baby's not really contributing a whole lot to the country right now um uh, baby just consumes and cries just leave it in there like why are we spending yeah. all this money right well that's because you know of what's known as inherent uh intrinsic value so you can't take a baby and compare it to something else because human beings in and of themselves hold value you can't say do i sell the baby or sell the car um, if you do, you're a sociopath. Mm -hmm. So um, solidarity happened and you had different faiths. You had different political standings. You had different ideological leanings all in that crowd waiting for that baby to come out. Um, that was really the event that put CNN on the map, I believe. Um, but the whole point I'm making is it was an inciting incident. And then people just became human at that point. And with the social media, with the, the way our culture is right now, with 
the way it's turned out where university people um, have a greater voice than your parents. <laughs> um, like there's these different things that have played out behaviorally that keep certain thought streams in the forefront and other thought streams in the distance. Um, it only takes about 3% of the culture to change a culture, to move a culture in any that, given direction. That's a, that's a tipping point, 3%. And so you got this tipping point where uh, if you just take, you know, Congress, government, so to speak, you take arts and entertainment, you take Hollywood, and then you take uh, education, uh, and then you take news media, boom, 3%. Um, and, and you've got this voice uh, that's getting all the airtime. Uh, and human beings, this is why advertising pays so much, because um, it works. Um, so it's these types of things that keep people locked in what we're in right now, but it's only going to take an inciting incident to get us out. Um, so will that happen? Yeah, it always does. <laughs> you look at any nation, um, any country, there's an inciting incident that comes. Um, anyway, that, 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 it's not going to happen by talking about people have differences. How do we fix it? Um, something else the unit the planets have to align and that will fix it in my i opinion. always said uh, sometimes i wish like an alien alien invasion happens we're like yeah oh, you fuck. know this is a part we, we gotta of me, we gotta come together there's a part of me that wants to believe in aliens so bad <laughs> but there just isn't enough evidence for it yeah what's that um, fermi's paradox where they say like mathematically there's no other life form but like i don't know that's been kind of debunked as well though yeah no there's in my, I mean, I, I give him, give us another 10, 15 years. We're going to find life on Mars. Um, yeah. But the issue with aliens, like not to sidetrack is like, we assume, cause we always view images as human. What do they call anthrom anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic, yeah. um, uh, uh, let's say structure. And yeah. so we think aliens must look like us. So that's why you see, for example, this gray tall skeleton, some somewhat it resembles, it resembles man. Like yeah. why can an alien be a bacteria or some kind of? Yeah, well, you know, one of the best alien movies um, is one of the. I can't call it off the top of my head. It, it, uh, that that weird shaped almond that's floating. Oh shit! Arrival. That's a fucking Arrival. movie. <clears throat> yeah, so that's more in line with what might happen if, yeah. if you see something, rather than you know, like you see on YouTube. Well, there's also there's a scientific. Uh, thesis out there that octopus might be aliens <laughs> yeah well if you go deep enough in the ocean you think you're seeing aliens that's for sure yeah um, okay. but through uh going back through your like because you do behavioral uh, assessments disc yeah. and you analyze human beings and yeah. uh, within disc you have two types of uh, two two things you analyze you have natural yeah that who you are then you have what's the other one not natural adapted, right? adapted right yeah and so kind of go into deeper of like these two types of profiles okay. a human has. Okay. So it, it, one is what I call concealed and the other revealed. So that's one way of looking at it or concealed behavior, unconscious behavior and intended behavior, what we do on purpose. So your natural graph. And again, we're measuring the four primary emotions, anger, optimism, patience, and fear. Uh, and those are primarily responsible for how you're going to do anything in the world. Like mm -hmm. no one's motivated all day long by disgust, right? Mm -hmm. It's an emotion, but it doesn't trigger how you're going to act in the world. Um, so the natural graph is self-existence or separate existence. It's you being you based on what your brain has learned to do over the years that you've been alive in an effort to succeed and survive the world in all the environments we find ourselves in. It is your character base and it's fluid. And what that means is human beings adapt to whatever environment they're in. If you're born into a family, you have an alcoholic parent, they don't work, you're struggling for food, you're one of seven children and you have to fight for the toast, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna you know, have an effect on how you view the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so nature, nurture, it's both. Um, the house shows up furnished, okay? If you've had children, you know this. 
Um, and so then, is, is there an issue though, when the two are not aligned together, when there's a huge discrepancy between the two? Well, um, if you read back to Dr. Steven Pinker from Harvard, his book, The Blank Slate, um, uh, you know, they used to believe we human beings, babies are born like a blank chalkboard and then the parents write on it. Like that's yeah. a falsity. That's not true. Um, and this is done through the work with uh, uh, identical twins. Um, never seen each other before, living in different countries, 40 some odd years of age, meet for the first time. They're both wearing the same shirt, same color. They both have an elastic band on their rest, left wrist. Nature, I mean, versus, nature versus nurture, yeah. Um, and so there's a large part of who we are that's naturally coming down into the, you know, the genome. Sure. And then, uh, and your parents' DNA. And then there's nature. And the greatest effect on us is not our parents, it's our peers. Uh, because we talk a certain way in front of the peers, but we don't talk that way in front of the parents. Of course. And the peers <laughs> are very cool. Um, so uh, anyway, that natural graph represents what we've learned to do to succeed and survive environments. So it becomes our, our most comfortable pair of shoes, so to speak, when it, behaviorally speaking. And that's mm -hmm. based upon emotions. Um, and when our emotions are in play, meaning the intensity on a graph scale runs higher than 50, then we rely on that emotion for all our decision making. So if your emotion is anger and you rely on that emotion for decision making, you're decisive. Yes. If you're relying on fear or patience as an emotion for decision making, you're indecisive. Okay, because that's the only emotional available. Um, your adapted sense is shared existence. So when I go to work and I work for someone, a corporation or a person, then there are expectations, re uh, requests, requirements, demands that are being made on me as an integral part of that organization. Can I meet those requests, requirements, those demands? Or can I not meet them? Well, if I'm not wired to meet them, I got to change my wiring if I want to keep my job. So your behaviors and your emotions are altered on purpose so that you can be successful in the job, right? And we do it in relationships. We do it in uh, work. Uh, we do it when we get in a car and drive. Like I've seen people that are kind of meek and mild, they get in the car and they're freaking dangerous. It's the one thing they can control, right? So it goes overboard uh, and they tailgate everybody. Um, you know, they do these crazy weird things and I, I observe this and I'm like, okay, I can get a profile now based upon, you know, what's happening here. That's called a high power line, which means, you know, they're the people in the passenger seat trying to find the brake when someone else is driving because they're not in control. Right. Um, so anyway, the natural graph is really a representation of our natural self and what that means. It's our energy, psychic energy, it's called. Um, for making decisions. So we know how we're going to make those decisions. When we get in the presence of other people, which is shared existence, we change in an effort to meet what they need if it's different from what we want. Um, so uh, I want to sleep in to nine o'clock. Well, I can't. I got a meeting at seven at work. Crap. I got to get up and get ready. So my energy levels change. My behaviors change in order to get to work. And then when I get there, I don't want to be there. I don't like the guy talking. You know, what am I going to do? Roll my eyes, breathe heavy, right? People do to tap the pen. Like we're showing behaviors because there are demands being, you know, applied and we don't want to meet them. Or in another scenario, we can't meet them. So we say, yeah, I'll do it. And then they leave the room and we don't do it. You know, because we're passive, so therefore we tell them what we think they want to hear. Then when they're gone, we try to figure out what we're going to do. So all these things take place. And that's how you can measure where someone is and then what they're doing emotionally in an effort to succeed in the environment and work. So I can look at a graph and see the differences between natural and adapted and say something like, uh, this guy will be gone in four weeks. He's going to quit. And they're like, how can you say that? Well, what's happening in an adapted sense? based upon 
what he's actually like is unsustainable. So the so, close, the closer they are together, the better. Well, it, that's that can be true because you're not having to adapt. So if mm. your graphs look extremely similar, you're either in your niche or you're not being managed. And so when we're being managed or macro or micro managed or over managed, then that creates stressors if the way they want us to do something is not in line with the way we're wired. That creates stress points. So have you found, have you found out though through your practice and studying this that people can change their innate hardwiring? I never I, I've never in the 15, almost 15 years I've been doing this, I have never recommended anybody change their innate wiring any more than I go to your house for dinner and look around and say, dude, you got to tear all these wires out and rewire this way. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, why? Like, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, so what I do and what we specialize in here at Behavioral Resource Group is when we work with people, we say, here's how you're wired. Now, what's the best scenario so that you can operate at peak performance? In other words, how can you be you and get paid? Yeah. Um, and so that's the goal. So less than 25% of the population is operating in actual talent in their work. Everybody else is in potential talent. And so uh, you're potentially talented. And if your brain is this way and your environment agrees with it, you have all the opportunity to move into actual talent. What happens is we're wired a certain way. We go to work and have to do something that goes against our brain grain and we'll never be talented there, even though we have talent. Here's a great example. A uh, company hired a guy before they hired me. They just hired a guy. I was recommended to them because they had him in training for three months and it was coming to the end of that training. And they're like, he ain't going to work out after 30 days in the field and getting paid. Um, so the company called me, I profiled that person, talked to them on the phone, didn't tell them he wasn't going to work out. That was their job, but they hadn't told him. So that's giving me a sign that there's a problem there because he didn't even know how they felt about him and they're going to fire him. Like, how did mm. that not be communicated? <laughs> um, but that's what was, that's typical. Um, so, uh, the guy had attention deficit disorder. Uh, he was unconventional. He had scattered brain type, you know, all these different things. So I said, you know, what's the problem with this guy? Oh, he forgets his laptop. Um, he's late. Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense. That's how his brain is. So why did you hire the guy? Oh, he's super connected. Oh, really? So you hired him because he's connected, but you fired him because he forgot his laptop. I said, you hired him for a strength, but you fired him for a weakness. Yeah. I said, why don't you hire him for a strength and then hire him and then use him for his strength? Like the one thing you hired him for, you're not even given a chance. How, how does that work? And they're like, oh, my God, I never thought of that. What do we do? Put him in the field for 90 days and then leave him alone. And let's see if for being forgetful gets in the way of his likely superpower, which is connectability. Put him in the field for 90 days. Within 60 days, made the biggest sale companies ever had since the early 1900s. It's amazing. Because, now, like, let, you know, let's he was focused like you... on his strength. And they weren't saying, no, nah, you're annoying me with that strength. Once you, once, you analyze, once you analyze his strengths and you analyze his behavior, this profile, yeah. is there a set, um, let's put it this is, is there a set recommendations you give people saying, hey, based on your uh, yeah. natural and uh, innate, we believe that you're best suited for X? Yeah. So uh, I'll look at a person and say, so, you know, and our other, we have another report called an IMO report, which is an integrated motivational orientation. So what motivates us? What causes our brain to feel good? You know, when the brain feels good, you're more productive, right? Oh, yeah. So, we want to be in a situation where our brain is always feeling good. We're going to get the most productivity out of a person if that's the case. So if they're what we call a freedom seeker, which means they need autonomy, personal freedom, independence uh, from, not dependence on, and they're, they have less fear in their emotional database, they're independent in that regard, uh, they're spontaneous in the way they think, um, they're not a planner. 
they're intuitive. So if you got a person like that, the best thing to do, if you can, let them work from home. Right? Now, more and more companies are doing that. But no, 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 he's got to do this, got to do that. Yeah, okay. Well, if you hire him and you do that, you will not get their full potential. And number two, they might not even last. Yeah. So, you know, screw your little policy um, that says, well, around here, we screw people is what you're saying. Because if you're going to work for us, you got to do this no matter what kind of brain you have. That's just cattle. Like, that doesn't work. Like, you have to respect people and how they're wired and get the most out of them by appreciating the type. And so I'll say, you know what? I don't know what your policy is, but you kind of need to be a little more hands off with this person. The more hands on you are, the less productive they're going to be. Now, if they're not good at what they do, why did you hire them? Like, it's not just behavior, it's skill. Like, are they versed in this? Are they skilled in this? You know how many people hire salespeople that were like formerly a chef or were formerly, you know, this or that? I'm like, why aren't you looking for someone who's been involved in sales and has already proved a capacity for selling and have they have a skill, right? Mm -hmm. We don't even know if they have a skill for selling. I know how they think, how they, I know, all, I know how they'll sell. But I don't know if they're skilled at it. Um, so yeah, but usually, usually the people saying they got to work from the office is like managers that want to keep their job because they don't want to be kind of <laughs> like, oh, we don't need managers now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. But you got to realize like a lot of managers, they don't create the environment. They want to control the environment. Yeah. And when that happens, every but he's like, you're, you're putting everyone in these little straight jackets and then sending them out to do your bidding. And you just can't do that. You got to, our goal here is helping people understand there need to be some environmental changes if this person is going to be successful. Um, uh, if you can't do that, then let's find somebody. I mean, if you're going to remain a salad, let's find you a tomato. Um, you know, if you're going to remain a toolbox, let's find you a hammer. Uh, but don't go putting the tomato in the toolbox and then telling me this isn't working. Of course it's not working. That doesn't work. Like people are very special and we're very unique. Um, I always struggled working for people. Why? Because they're always telling me how to do something. I'm an independent thinker. Like I can't do that. I might not even think you're smart. Um, I mean, so that's going to be a problem because I have an innate need to control my space, my environment and my future and not give the wheel to you when you're a drunk driver. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, I can't work in that environment. So if I was in the corporate world, I would be unsuccessful in, in a lot of these different situations you and me both brother you and me both you know and people think at me like, oh man i god i wish you worked at this company it's like no you don't like i could be your biggest problem even though i understand human behavior it doesn't mean that i'm going to be able to acclimate to the way you do things there right um and even when i was involved in working with youth and different things people like we want you to do this want you to do that say like, only if i can control everything and they're like, what? I'm like, I know that sounds terrible. Well, who are the, what, what I can't do it otherwise. But what kind of profile are these people that just want to control? I've always wondered, like, why is there a necessity or deep yearning need to control others? Okay, so. I know it's a, that, that's a deep question. It's a deep question. And there isn't one answer. Oh, this. That's not how it is. But there are a variety of reasons. Um, I, you know, and I could see where there's a deeper need because I know when you enter what we call the need zone on a graph, right? So it's called a power uh, orientation uh, or element. And what it represents is the need to have authority that's equal to or greater than your responsibility. That's basically what it means. So it's a need or is it a want, right? So if I want a wife, I'll find a good one. If I need a wife, I'll marry anyone. So need-oriented decisions are never the best decisions because they're trying to meet something insatiable. And so if I need to be in charge versus I want to be in charge, then I'm going to have predictable behaviors around being in charge. I'm going to want to always have available to everyone around me signs of my authority. Like 
a cool business card with my name on it. Um, uh, uh, my name on my parking space. Um, you know, I have reminding people, remember, you're not in charge. I am. You know, you know people that do this. And the reason being is because being in charge is a need. Mm -hmm. um, never give a person power who needs it. Ever. Like, that's like behavior 101. Um, it's interesting how, person, such a certain how some sort of people gravitate to certain professions, like the power status professions. Okay, yeah, that's where you find all the sociopaths. <laughs> the power roles. Yeah. Right? Clergy, law enforcement, CEOs, lawyers, heart surgeons, um, uh, military. You will find, um, so you know, functional sociopaths. Um, and, uh, a great book that'll cover all your bases on psychopathy is, uh, the sociopath next door by, uh, 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 Martha Stout, uh, PhD. That's fantastic. And if you're an audio listener, you won't be able to stop. Um, there has to, there has to be some kind of evolutionary reasons why sociopaths exist. They have to fit in the role of tribe somehow. I mean, you could put them in a tribe, but I think it's an abnormality in the brain. You know, I mean, mm. they they can now scan your brain and tell if you're so. Yeah, I've seen that in the MRIs. Yeah. Yeah. So your amygdala is shrunken, and you have less activity in the bottom part of your frontal lobe, your neocortex. Like, there's things that will determine potential psychopathy. Uh, or when you're nine, you're like in the backyard stabbing frogs. That's the easiest way to find. Yeah, it. I saw that correlation between abusing. Uh animals at a young age and becoming a sociopath yeah yeah that's the best big you know you know abusing animals at a young age and like kids i remember kids that would put firecrackers in the frog's mouth hmm. and laugh like <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious give me another one like that's that's a lack of empathy for for, for life right um that's a sign um not all those people are serial killers mm -hmm. right but they will lie their way to the top. Uh, they will throw people under the bus, like, and, and relish it. Um, you see a lot of this in government. That's another place where sociopaths gravitate. Congress, um, it's all power. It's all authority. <clears throat> you know, people think politics is all about being a public servant. Are you, like, on crack? Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with service. You want to be a public servant, join the military. But yes. if, if you want to, if you want power and authority, become a politician. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite people, I studied Joseph Campbell. He talks about no matter where you are in the political spectrum, it's always about aggression. It's either my way or the highway. There's no compromise. Like we, you're going to do it this way. That's it. Right. And why does somebody enter politics at all? Oh, I want to make the world a better place. No, you want to control the policy. Yes. You want to drive the car this way because you see it going that way and you disagree with it and if you get in you can get the wheel and that's what it's about it has nothing to do with serving people mm -hmm. um it has everything to it's do virtual with signaling too because if you want to just serve people just shut your mouth and go do stuff <laughs> exactly. you know what i mean it's like you don't have to I make know. a proclamation on fucking facebook it's like yo i'm doing this shut the fuck up man go do something <laughs> like shit Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest acts of kindness I've ever done. Nobody knows about like, I don't, you know, do that. I mean, I'll, I'll be driving in my car and taking pictures of stuff and putting it on Facebook and all that. But then you got people like they're doing all these service acts and they're videoing the whole thing, like video and giving food to the homeless. Like, what is that? But there's so many things there. We could talk a whole podcast about it. Um, but anyway, the whole political thing, it's power and authority and control, and that's all that is about. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking charge, uh, being in control, um, taking control uh, of situations. We're glad when things go awry that there's somebody there who takes control and gains yes. control. Or the plane goes down. There's 100 people on the plane. 60 survive. And somebody stands up and said, all right, got to get a fire going. Quit your crying. But we're happy. Someone's got some direction. <laughs> They're making me do something. Yes. Right? Else we're all going to waller in our self-pity, and these people are going to do this, these people are going to do that. That's why I like some of these reality shows. 
uh, like Breaking Bad or Lost or I any of these things. Love Breaking Bad. You see these behavioral um, personality types assume their roles, right, throughout the process. And, it, and what's great about Breaking Bad is you've got Walter White, who uh, is a uh, engineering type chemist thinker. And through the eight seasons, he turns into a sociopath. Yeah. It's, oh, for me, it's like fantastic. And, and of course, you know, Jesse, uh, he's the influencer. He's the one with all the friends. So he implores him to get out and build a, build a base, right? And he can't keep his stupid mouth shut because no. he doesn't think he feels. Uh, the whole thing is fantastic. Um, so if you understand what's happening in the brain, you can start predicting, you know, what will happen. But where do we go? Where do we go in the future as humans? That are like, for example, on the subject of politics, you know, for me, I don't like labels, but for me, I'm a firm believer in limited government, sovereign uh, identity, sovereign individual rights over this whole group think group collective. And so we have, you know, you know, you have a bell curve and obviously on like you have the far left, you have the far right, you know, libertarian socialism. And they can be screaming facts on both sides, X, Y, and Z, but no one's actually listening at all because all they care about is their perspective. Right. And so, like, you know, for me, I'm more on the libertarian leaning side, and I don't want to be stuck in the eco chamber myself. You know, our family comes from former Yugoslavia. We lived through a socialist system, you know, very ugly system, former Russia, ugly system, former China, ugly system. We've seen it firsthand. It's not like theory. We've lived through the process right. of what socialism creates. And so, like, I'm trying to figure out how do we destroy or how do we mitigate cognitive dissidence or how do we start actually finding more of a common ground to communicate as opposed to like blah, 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 both sides just screaming at each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is a way to do it. I mean, if you've ever read The Righteous Mind um, uh, uh, by Jonathan uh, H H H Hayek, Hayek. Yeah. yeah, Jonathan Hayek, Hayek The Righteous yeah. Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Religion and Politics. Um, uh, uh, fantastic book, but he basically breaks that down in a real comprehensive way of, of how this is done. So there's two parts of your brain. When I say that, it's, I'm saying that not as a brain, not as a neurologist who really knows the brain intricately, but because your brain is more like a cake. Uh, there's ingredients, but they're put together and you have the cake, but you don't open the cake up and go, there's the egg. Mm -hmm. um, it's in there, but it isn't, right? Um, so although you have areas that do have certain functions, your brain works as a whole. All, everything's integrated in so many levels. You can't compartmentalize it like that. But we do to make the talk make sense, and that's sure. what I'm doing. So there's a part of your brain that is what Hake calls the rider of the elephant, and then there's a part of your brain that he calls the elephant. So there's the elephant and its rider. The elephant is the big elephant in the room. It's the biggest part. And that is your, your emotion, your visceral limbic orientations, mm -hmm. uh, heartbeat, lungs, uh, white cell count. You know, we're not thinking of, we're not sitting there going, ah, trying to keep our heart beating. It happens, right? It's, it's very ancient. It's in the lower uh, 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 reptile part of our brain. Sure. Um, and then the limbic system all the emotional circuitry there um, that has these feelings. So whatever you feel is the, that elephant, the rider's on top of the elephant and he's moving along with the elephant and he's the reasonable part of your brain. So your reasonable mind goes with your feelings, right? And while this is taking place, rather than the reasonable part of your brain making the elephant stop, it can't because it's too big. So what the, the rider of the elephant does is is justify why the elephant's going in this direction rather than verify if it's the correct direction, right? So this is what happens with, with human beings. When you're trying to talk like you and I, let's say we have a difference of opinion. I could tell right now, if we were vehemently on opposing polar ends, you and I would both listen to each other. Sure. We would have, we would laugh. We could still go to have coffee afterwards, right? Sure. We're sensible people. Um, our IQ is at a certain place. Um, our emotional intelligence is at a certain level. Um, there's a lot of factors that are playing into why we can do that. Most people can't. Okay. You've heard of the 80, 20 rule. Mm -hmm. Parita, well, yeah. Use that for intelligence. Okay. 
And so there, you know, the, the, the people that can do these things are the minority, not the majority. Okay. Uh, and, and, and hold this thought for a minute, because I just thought of something that's going to play right into this, what I'm telling you about having this, able to have these conversations. Out of my profiles, there's about 36 different patterns you're going to get. The 47% of our country is only two of them. Wow. So, I mean, let that sink in. And they're passive. And they're not take charge. Hmm. They're hope and doubt. Or hope and imagine. But they're, none of them are make. They don't make it happen. They either imagine things happening, hoping things happen, or doubt things will happen. And a combination of those three. The Trump types make it happen, less than 4%. Okay, so it's it's a wonder that less than 20 percent of the population is in, in the voting block, um, you know, because more people that are more about making something happen or control something, they're, they're, it gets diminished. Right. Everybody. Most people are followers. But this kind of scares me moving like populism scares me. Even like Plato used to tell you in Plato's Republic to talk about democracy is highly flawed. And I agree. Like, I think direct democracy some people hate me for saying this. I mean, it's a highly flawed system because it's so easy. You can easily manipulate and sway public opinion. Like look at Edward Bernays, nephew of Freud, like the yeah. godfather of modern day propaganda over here. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, what do we do as a society? And obviously cultural context matters. Right. That's very important. Like how, what do we do to kind of, yeah. well, I want, I want to say educate because it's not educate. It's more awareness. Like how do we, how do we create awareness that yeah. we create a more, I would say one negativity kind of yeah. it's social media is fucking everything up. It's hot. It's highlighting the worst of the worst of yeah, human behaviors. Like, yeah. Well, uh, to, answer your question, Wilson has to have these conversations, you have to appeal to people's elephants and not their riders. Ah, and yeah, you go. have to appeal to their emotional being. You have to, how do you do that? You listen to what they're saying and say, you know what? I know exactly what you mean by that. And I know exactly why you're thinking that. And you know what? You could be right. Now you're going to be like, Oh, well, what do you have to say? Uh, you're and I'm not doing that up. to patronize you. I'm doing that because I really care about how you feel, right? So yes. the more intrinsic, the more intrinsic value, the more valuation you have of other people, it's called feeling into people. Yep. Um, it's empathy. Yep. The more empathy you have, the better the conversation is going to go, and the more the sharing of ideas will take place. The less empathy you have and the, the more emotional distancing takes place between you and another person. This is why when you get on social media and they can't see you, they don't know who you are really, where you're coming from, and you do a tweet, there's the, it's the greatest emotional distance between you and whoever's going to read it. You don't mm -hmm. even know who they are that's going to read it. Mm -hmm. So now you can say the most bizarre, ridiculous things. But if we're sitting together having coffee... You know, and I know there's going to be certain things we ain't going to say. Yeah. Right. Are, are you familiar with Chris Voss, the FBI uh, negotiator? He wrote the book, Never Split the Difference. Oh, I've heard of the book. Yeah. But, oh, you, you got to fucking read it. But he has a he has a chapter in the book called uh, That's Right. And, it, and he's like one of the best ways of negotiating with anybody is getting them to say that's right. Understanding their viewpoint on an empathetic level. I'm yeah. Like I get it, man. I get it, and for them to say that's right, you understand. Yes. yes, and the friends that I have that have differing differences in opinion than I have, that's the relationship. We respect what they think. Now, mm -hmm. none of these people are sociopaths or functional sociopaths or non-empathetic people. I do not make friends with those people. The people I make friends with tend to be somewhat like me, or at least better than me. Um, so I level up in my friendships. Um, I'll help anybody, but I'll hang around only certain people. I only hang around people I want to be like. Um, and so in that, in that way of doing things, you grow and you become more informed, more enlightened, um, and things of that sort. Um, so if we're going to make a difference in the world, it's only going to happen in our one-on-ones. Yeah. It's but not this kind of scares me. Then, like, 
Yeah, but this also scares me where you see what's happening. Uh, you know, I never went to high school. I don't believe in the modern educational system. I think it's failed us. But you look at modern day university right now, you, they have safe spaces. They have only one way of thinking. You're not allowed to voice your opinion. I'm like, how is this healthy for society? It kind yeah, of reminds that's not going to last. No, hopefully not. That's not, not. going to last. It's a phase. Um, so, you know, certain brain types and, and, and emotional people are getting their day in the sun. Great. It's your turn anyway. Um, so that'll happen and it, it'll move on because it's not sustainable. Uh, you can't, it can't sustain it. Yeah. My opinion, my educated guess is education is going to move to an online platform. Um, uh, and, uh, people are going to be teaching from their living room, um, or an office, uh, like Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you know, and you know, you, you don't even need a university. Not we have YouTube. I mean, my son, he, he's a scientist. I mean, ants and beetles and uh, he, he's got he's got more on YouTube than he'll ever get anywhere. And now it's good to be with the person like in a classroom and and talk with an instructor and read the body language, feel their emotions like you can't replace that. That's discipleship. Right. You can't replace that. Um, but for just becoming more informed, um, uh, you know, you can get all that online, video, um, audio book. Uh, more people are getting university educations driving to work today uh, than they, and better education than they ever got at school, um, simply because of the way things are changing. So we're really in flux right now. Yes. You know, but through, there's a, in, whenever there's flux, there's massive chaos. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, whenever there's change uh, that's happening, um, there's, there's a great degree, there'll be a great degree of unrest, um, people being, you know, upset out of a, an emotional position or something they've been in for a long time and now they're being unseated. Um, and so, uh, and it, you know, when the baby has to be, you know, isn't allowed to play with the spider it kicks and screams and blah, blah, blah. And then after a while, it gets over it. But the initial, no, you can't play with that. I know you've been playing with it for about 10 minutes. I didn't notice it. No, now I'm going to take your fun away. There's a there's outrage. There's emotional outrage when that happens. But then it's okay. So right now, there's a lot of emotional outrage um, that's, that's happening. And what human beings will do is what they do best, survive. So yeah. we will survive it. And we will be better for it and we'll evolve through it. But right now it is a mess. It's a mess. And hopefully I think, you know, let's fast forward a decade from now. I think looking back in hindsight, we realize how detrimental for the psychology of human social media is and will yes. become to a greater degree. And I think in the future, a lot of new startups and companies or there's going to be movements of like minimizing tech exposure, minimizing who was it, it was on. I think it was Eric, was it Eric Weinstein? He was on Joe Rogan's podcast. No, it wasn't. No, it was Jonathan. Uh, what was his last name again? Jonathan. Uh, hey, he was just on. Uh, yeah, it was him. He was talking about the correlation of uh, young female suicide rates. And when, when, when Facebook just started to kind of explode in popularity in 2012 and 2013, and how it's extremely detrimental. And I'm like, I agree. I'm like, think about it. It's like you have all these social cues, social pressure, cognitive biases being bombarded on you on a 24-7 basis, and your dopamine's getting hit, your serotonin's getting hit. No fucking shit, your brain's gonna be whacked. Yeah, yeah. It you know, it isn't good. Um, you know, I was in the airport not long ago, and there was a poster in a frame in behind glass uh, in one of the hallways leading out of the terminal. And it was a dentine commercial. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. <laughs> um, and it had a woman kind of leaning into the open door of a taxi cab in the back, whispering in a male in the guy's ear. And at the bottom, it said the original instant message. <laughs> um, and it, when I, I get like choked up when I read it, when I saw that, and I'm like, oh my God, remember, remember that? Like society is so different right now. Like, Think about touching, right? Just just human touch. You go into the bathroom at the airport. You don't touch the faucet. You don't touch the toilet. You don't touch the paper towels. Yes. You don't touch anything. Everything's automatic, right? 
So we're getting more and more touchless. Like I know they tried to enact a law in Massachusetts where it was against the law to sit on Santa's lap. Really? Uh, yeah, because they're ready, worried about lawsuits. Yeah, I get it. Santa wiggled the wrong way. I don't know. Um, but these different things that are happening um, at work, no hugging, um, no touching. Da -da. So what happens is when you don't allow meaningful touch, which is a human fundamental or axiomatic element for the brain, then you're going to create people who touch wrong. <laughs> yeah. Or you create like schizophrenic. Cra All the touching goes nuts. Yeah. It goes crazy. So the very thing you're trying to prevent, you create. Um, I don't know if you remember this when the shuttle, the original shuttle blew up. What is it? 1986, 87, 88. Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. And the school teacher, um, Michael Smith was one of the pilots. Um, and the shuttle exploded. I watched it. I was in living in Florida uh, when it happened. And um, I think it was 1990 when they found the recorder um, uh, from the shuttle disaster. And they listened to it. And there was a spot on there where right before the explosion, like six seconds, I believe, was before the explosion. I think it was Michael Smith said, uh-oh. Um, um. Uh, meaning they knew it was going to happen. And then you could hear a faint whisper in the background. Somebody say, give me your hand. Like, so here we got a bunch of smart people because you're not stupid if you're in the shuttle. Yeah. Um, in the shuttle. And when it came down to like this life or death, worst moment imaginable, someone decides to touch somebody. Not say anything. Just hold a hand, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. <clears throat> like, that's how humans are wired for deep, meaningful communication and touch so this whole social media thing again it's good it's come on strong it is what it is but it's going you're going to find out all the terrible things and then you're right normal people that have common sense will begin to like you know what we're pulling back like already right now you go to certain masterminds you got to put your phone in a box like you can't even have it like because they've learned before anybody else uh, because they're all thinkers like that don't work and we're not going to be present if we've got the phone mm -hmm. um, and so Simon Sinek, you know, he's talking about some of these things um, But the, the we're figuring it out, but we're learning right now. We're learning what not to do right now That's where we're at um, And it'll fix itself um, It always does um, and we'll realize and then you know we'll look back remember when you know a fax machine was the size of a suitcase you know and that's what it'll be like remember when there was all this social media craze um and that's what will happen um but there is no formula for stopping it um human beings have to learn that when you touch the stove you burn your hand and then they stop touching it mm -hmm. and sometimes you know you you they can't learn any other way um, and that's what's going to happen, I, in my opinion, with all this social media coverage and the way we're doing things and all these heated debates. And uh, you can't who was the newsman in the Midwest? This is horrible. But Martin Luther King Day is what he wanted to say. But he said Martin Luther Coon Day. Oh, he did. Shut up. <laughs> and it was just it was like oh, he, he didn't even finish the word, but you knew there was an end coming. But he stopped yeah. himself. It yeah. was just a slip of the tongue and he wasn't thinking or whatever. He didn't what's even it, know. What's that called? A, a Freudian slip? A Freudian slip. But he didn't even know he had done it until the next day when basically he got fired. Yeah. Um, and so when Don Lemon comes to your defense, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know you're innocent. Yeah. Right? And so Don Lemon and some others were like, that's ridiculous. I mean, we've all done that. We make mistakes. Well, hopefully, hopefully people start waking up and realize, listen, like everyone fucks up. Everyone makes mistakes. It's a different when it's acute versus chronic. And like, yeah. you know, even though I'm not religious, there is a saying in the Bible, ye be the first one to cast a stone who has never sinned. Fuck, yeah. everyone has fucking sinned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's part of life. Um, you know, it's a human so, nature. You know, but you see – to to catch people puts you in a particular tribe yes and so there's this alleged tribe of purity that's so funny coming from some of the most impure people mm -hmm. right 
I mean, look at the Harvey Weinstein thing. Until it was popular, no one minded. Yes. Everybody just looked the other way. I mean, who's the guy that did Bohemian Rhapsody? Oh, fuck. Malik? Something, uh, the main actor? People are, saying, people are calling on him like, why? He just allegedly a yeah. pedophile. He is? Yes. Oh, shit. Um, so I just heard this uh, came out the other day. And they're like, kind of the, why kind of every, where's me too? Why is everybody yeah. silent? Well, he's right. He's making the money. I mean, he's making people money. Well, this is virtual signaling again. If it doesn't fit in the the narrative of virtual signaling or somehow having some kind of beneficiary effect on certain shareholders, or there's some kind of agenda, somebody yeah. benefits at the end of the road. Yeah. It never sees any light. No one cares about it. Right. You think Gillette really cares? They don't give a flying fuck about two boys wrestling in the backyard. They're gonna run, break it up, and saying that's not nice. Yeah. Or is it because for the last six years their profits keep dropping? Yeah. Like. I mean, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out what human beings are doing. People are in business to make money, and all the decisions they make while in business are about money. Mm -hmm. They're not in business to be moral. These people, you know, Hollywood aren't preachers, but they're acting like they are. Mm -hmm. Preachers are what they make fun of, and yet they're trying to be that. But Hol it's not Hol real. Hol Hollywood's sick in its own twisted yeah, it, 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 ecosystem. Yeah, there's a lot of sick people. Um, in that tribe um but you know uh it's <laughs> i don't even have a lot I have a, i'm at a loss for words for some of it i did it, it, it it's it's hard to fathom but it's just what people do but if you understand how people think how tribes operate um uh then it all makes sense and it's it's more palatable because you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I predicted that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that's what they're going to do. Um, you know, it comes down to this whole Jesus narrative. You know, Father, forgive them. They're stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you got to find a place in your brain to be able to categorize people as, you know what, they just don't get well, it. I would, I, would say, I would say an individual is highly, as you mentioned earlier, highly intelligent. We can sit down and we may come to, you know, might have rapport for each other or common ground. But it's the fucking group think that scares the shit out of me. This populism this yeah it's you get you get so absorbed in this group thing that is like you don't think for yourself you're not rational you don't even digest the information you're receiving to earn internalize it to then implement it with your own viewpoint of your own life to kind of like then like what is my take on this information that i got and then how does that reflect with the with what i believe already and does that change my viewpoint and no none of that it's just regurgitation right and a lot of the people in these group think dynamics are not thinkers right it's it, it's group it's copy mm -hmm. um they just copy they they parrot um uh you know you watch these hilarious but sad um videos on youtube of people like going out saying uh so uh what do you think about and they'll, they'll say a politician and about their policy but the policy they're talking about is their enemy's policy. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> right? And then the church like, oh, I think that's excellent. You know, I'm definitely voting him, and that's the reason I'm doing it. Yeah. And you're like, what? Yeah, but who, you know, who, who knows the policy? I always said for people to vote, there should be some type of, like, minimum acceptance test where it's like you have to understand the policies of the people that you're voting for, and you have to pass, like, kind of a quiz. Yeah, if you're going to take a blood test to get married. You still have to do that, right? Yeah, I guess. I don't you gotta know. You got to take a blood test to get married. Yeah. To get your marriage license. Yeah. Um, uh, well, no one's going to be living in my house with me. Like, but yet when it comes to voting, you don't even need a driver's license now. No, but it's scary, man. Popul populism voting scares. That's the one thing that really scares me for humans is like, it's so easy to sway them to vote a certain person. Yeah. And it's it like, is. do you even uh, like, okay. I, We'll take the person's policies out of the equation. Like, do you even understand like who this person is, what their track record is, what they're trying to change, how they're going to change it? Like, have you done any of your due diligence? Then have you done yeah. due diligence on the party? Then have, like none of that. It's like, oh, because she's female, I'm going to vote for. Him. Like, is she the best fucking candidate? Like, fuck me, man. It's like you're just going to vote because they look like you. Yeah. Like, well, you know they. Oh. I think it was Haight who did this, um, or at least he talks about the experiment where 
they took a bunch of college students and they took a bunch of candidates that had already won their offices mm -hmm. and they had the headshots. Um, and of course the, the kids, they didn't know who they were. And they said, who do you vote for? Who do you think wins? And they got 70% right based on a headshot. Wow. 70% accuracy based upon looks alone. That's how people vote. Mm -hmm. um, you got a minority of people that are thinking through a vote. You got a majority of people voting on teeth. Man, we need to make kind of like a, kind of like a council or some kind of like a more stronger republic when it comes to the voting system. Like I rather have, okay, for example, let's say they want to build like a new nuclear power plant near a certain neighborhood. I, I'm the first, I'm not fucking smart enough to know if that's the correct answer or not. I don't right. know shit about nuclear power or deciding, <laughs> I don't know, not, I'm fucking in moron. How, how am I going to vote on this shit? Right. Like, but but right. Like, if I find like a nuclear scientist that understands, I'm like, yo, yeah. I'm going to delegate my vote to him. Yeah. He can listen, vote on my behalf. Here, here's, here's the enigma here. It isn't going to get fixed. And the reason why this isn't going to get fixed, this whole populist thing you're talking about, is because it's advantageous to the leaders to keep it this way. Of course it is. Okay, it's very advantageous to have people voting based upon how they feel or what group they're part of. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you're wondering why there's a real push to get non-citizens into the country, it's because they vote a certain way. Mm -hmm. if, if every person breaking down the barriers of America was a libertarian or a, a, a Republican, the Democrats would be building the wall. Yeah, themselves. themselves. <laughs> They'd be out there building their own wall. Everybody knows this, but nobody can really talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then the people that don't know it have cognitive dissonance in the different direction. Um, uh, and so, and you know, people listening to us right now, they're saying, well, you have cognitive dissonance. <laughs> That's why you're like, answer, correct. <laughs> that's correct mm -hmm. um so that but we are open for the conversation and the discussion and even changing our minds which i've done mm -hmm. um and i continue to do and the people that know me and know me well know that's one of my virtues um and so um so i can speak about it um so you know um we're going to do what everybody's always done. We're going to push through. We're going to keep our own direct space safe. We're going to protect our families. We're going to associate with like-minded people who are empathetic and caring. And we're going to do the best we can with what we've got to work with. And that's all we're going to do. I love it. I think we'll wrap it up, up at that. That's a great way to end the segment. Yeah. Uh, I bet there's a bunch of people who are really interested in what you do. What's the best resource for them to reach out to you? Uh, well, you could go to behavioralresourcegroup.com. Okay. Um, the easiest way is maybe Google Steven Sisler. Um, uh, I'm probably like on the first three pages that will come up there. Um, okay. uh, Amazon, put my name in there. Um, my, my personal best-selling book right now is The Four People Types and What Drives Them. And some of the stuff we've talked about is in there. Um, I'll uh, I'll make sure I leave a link below this video too. So yeah, so I highly, I highly recommend check out uh, Stephen's work. It's been it's for me it's been remarkable, and what he does is amazing. I appreciate that a lot, Amir. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, no, it's good. I I always enjoy talking with you, and definitely watching your presence online. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, I actually laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I got no filter. Yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, brother. Always a pleasure, my friend. Yes, thank you, sir. I'll talk to you soon, man. All right. Cheers. Yeah.